setting standards, you should always try to set the standards before the negotiation starts. People see the value of the general rule at the start of the process. If you don't do that and try to set standards later, when it clearly benefits you, others will think you are being manipulative and taking advantage of the situation. A good standard to set at the start of the business meeting might be any item you can serve in 15 minutes, you go on to the next item. So at 3 o'clock in the morning, instead of being on time 4, we are on time 30 with 4 to go, then we go back and serve the hard ones. This is called the process standard or standard to govern the process that people will use to negotiate. An agenda is a process standard. Most people don't think agendas are a big deal, so they don't set what. They have an idea of where they want to go, and that's good enough. I disagree. It's not good enough. I can imagine having a meeting without, without an agenda. If you know what you want to talk about, an agenda sets a standard for proceeding. If you get lost, it helps you get back on track. You need to make sure that everyone agrees on the agenda. That way, if someone interrupts and tries to go off on a tangent, you can note that everyone agreed to the agenda. You can write the new subject on the board for all to see on the other business. Even for a simple meeting, you need an agenda. If you have set an agenda before the meeting, check it again at the start of the meeting in case things have changed. We all know how easy it is for meetings to go off track. Not having an agreed open agenda at the start is like getting in the car without reaction to your destination. In negotiating, start with the easy things. It gives both parties a sense of accomplishment. An easy thing is, when is the next meeting? Even if the first five items are merely logistical, they are not trivial. Accomplishing anything makes the parties feel much better about the meeting and become much more collaborative. At the final negotiation for a $300 million merger between two high technology companies, progress was glacially slow with lots of bickering. I realized that the committee was too large to reach an agreement anytime soon. And I caught the eye of someone on the other side, Rick Seyford. Hey Rick, want to have a cup of coffee in the next room? I said, maybe Rick and I could start to work something out. The reaction of Rick's colleagues was swift. I don't know about that, said the CEO of Rick's company. They were thinking I was going to divide and conquer that Richard Rick would give something away or that I would somehow take advantage of Rick. This was, of course, ridiculous. So I said, Oh, I see. You think I'm going to brainwash Rick in 15 minutes? Is that right, Rick? And am I going to be able to brainwash you in 15 minutes? where his colleagues felt foolish. They realized that they had shown no confidence in Rick, a seasoned negotiator, and that their fears were unfounded. I thought with the pictures in their heads, and I realized they were probably wondering <clears throat> why I wanted to meet with Rick privately. So I added, 
I tell you what, Rick and I are going to have coffee. I bet we both need some. Why don't you guys give Rick and me something to work on while you are having coffee? We'll try to come back with a solution. This seemed reasonable to everyone. So they gave us a problem to work on. Rick and I went into the next room, commiserated on how slow this was going, worked on our task, found a solution, and then came back to the negotiation. Our collaborative answer changed the whole tenor of the negotiation, and the merger negotiation was successful. <clears throat> what if you don't know what the other party's standards are? What should you do? Ask in your job, ask for the criteria they use to decide raises and bonuses. If they won't tell you, mention nicely that you can meet their needs unless you know exactly what they want from you. Get them to be as specific as possible, both about their needs and the amount of the bonus. Then, when you meet the standards, it is much easier for you to make the case for a raise. Find out the consumer price index and see if you have been paid more or less in real dollars this year versus last year. If less, ask if you are at least as valuable this year as last or find some measurement of the company's success to news. There are situations where this won't work. As I said, no tool is perfect. But if it works more often than if you don't try, and even a small increase in your success rate will have a major positive impact on your life. Asking the other party for their standards often values them, particularly if you do it respectfully. I was late on paying a bill paying a big bill to American Express, I must refused to give me the attached airline miles as a result. I was about to get angry at the Amex customer service rep. Since I was a long time Amex, Amex customers, then I stopped myself and thought about her day. I bet People scream at you all day long. I said to her on the phone, they do, she said. I bet a lot of people threaten to cancel their card when they don't get their miles, I said. Absolutely, she said. What do you do in such a case? I said, well, she said, I just transfer them to the credit card cancellation department. I don't have to have that garbage. Do you ever restore people's miles when they have been late paying their bill? I asked. Sure, she said. When I asked, she said. When they apologize, when they thank me, when they promise never to do it again, and when they are nice to me. I said, you know, I really apologize for being late on my account. I'd really thank you if you could restore the miles for me. I promise never to do it again. I, and I think you are a really nice person. She left and said, the miles are already back in your account. This is something you will get better at with practice. Control the criteria by which decisions are made in news to be that female executives and managers read When their male counterparts asked that the woman take the chalk and write the meeting points on the blackboard. My advice is you should always take the chalk. That way you control the process. I once had a negotiation in Atlanta with CEO Buddy Ray and CFO Wayne with advertising Foods. 
the world's largest producer of chicken, beef, and pork. I was representing a Croatian client that owed Tyson more than $75 million for chicken that my client had distributed in Russia. I was trying to reduce the size of the debt and negotiate a plan that would enable the client to remain in business. I was much younger than they were and knew how to type, so I offered to take the meeting minutes. The Tyson CEO sort of waved me off with some condescension and said fine, I should take the minutes. So I wrote down the meeting notes exactly as I wanted, organized the main points exactly as I wanted typed up the meeting memo exactly as I wanted, typed up the agenda for the next meeting exactly as I wanted, and sent it off to the Tyson executives. At the next meeting, we had this silver-haired Tyson CEO walked in, holding a laptop computer awkwardly as if he never had one before. He gestured pointedly at me and exclaimed, I will take the minutes no for he. No matter what your level in, a nego in a, an organization, just by asking somewhere pressed questions, you can soon control the meeting. What are our goals here? You might say in a, in a non-threatening way, What's the problem? You might say tactfully. You might offer to write these up on the board, asking permission to do so. Soon, you will control the meeting. Naming bad behavior. It is just one step from naming their standards to naming bad behavior. A person who behaves badly, implicitly, violates his or her own standards by acting counter to the practice of the society, company, group, or other organization to which they belong. Society in this case includes third parties to whom the other party appears before them. Before them. And third parties are key, whether present or absent. A person who appears uh, reasonable before important third parties would lose credibility and could be criticized or even fired. Often, when people behave badly to you, you can get a cheat or an IOU in return for their bad behavior. An apology is a cheat. If your car, if your car gets delivered back late from the shop, you might get a free oil change if you note the bad behavior. Some of the examples above involve implied third parties, as in the case of the immigration officer in Tortola, or if the prime minister found out she violated his pledge. And naming bad behavior is particularly useful for women executives in male-dominated corporate streets. There are a lot of different ways to do it, directly with humor, etc. Almost all are effective. One female vice president was a particularly collaborative person. This was your ordinarily wonderful but she was in a shark den. One day, she was talking to the CEO of the company with another vice president of men. The other vice president repeatedly interrupted her then in the middle of a sentence. As she walked, was what taking, the other VP walked away, embarrassing her. She thought, 
that this was the time to make a step. After she finished, finished talking to the CEO, she pulled up to the male vice president. Let me ask you a question, she said. Yes, he said. What were you thinking about when you walked away? <clears throat> In the middle of a sentence, when I was talking to the CEO, embarrassed me, she said. What were your goals? What kind of relationship did you want to have with me? Would you have done it if I were a man? She said that he apologized to her for two days. Great negotiators have a firm grasp of the obvious and they say it. <clears throat> so you need to be direct about naming bad behavior. Is it necessary for you to be shouting at me? You might ask, or I promised to try hard to never interrupt you. May I have the same consideration? Remember, these are tools you can use often with hard bargainers who, didn't, who don't seem to get the concept of relationship and are trying to undermine you. In the movie, Get Shorty, the John Travolta character is giving negotiation advice to the character played by Gene Hackman. Travolta tells Hackman that when he negotiates, he should open the blind to make sure that the other party sits with the sun in his eyes and therefore gets distracted. Now, if that happened to you, wouldn't you want to call the other party on it? Why am I sitting here with the sun in my eyes? What well, you might say, Does this sun is distracting. Why don't we close the blood so I can focus more on our conversation and on what you are saying? You need tools to deal with hard bargainers. Not all negotiators are nice. Some people advise you to be nice in a negotiation that it contains a lot of power. Well, that depends on the situation. If you are in the water with sharks, you need shark that part. I'd rather be nice, but I'm not going to leave myself or you unprotected if the situation does not call for niceness. Here is the key to naming bad behavior, and this is one of the most powerful tools of all in naming bad behaviors. You must never make yourself the issue. If you do, you lose the cheat because then you are also unreasonable. Attorney make, the, make this mistake often. They may say, how dare you call me a jerk, you jerk. In fact, the meaner and more difficult they become, the calmer, the quieter you must become. This is one of the few tools against which there is no defense. For example, say in a very sweet voice, Why are you swearing at me? I would never curse at you. Why we respect you? You want to put, you want to put all the focus on that. They will drive themselves off a cliff appearing increasingly original. The best modern practitioner of this tool was Mahatma Gandhi. He took the jewel in the crown India from the British Empire 
without ever raising his voice or ever raising a weapon. The more vicious the British became, the more passive he became. Finally, Britain became so extreme they could not withstand the onslaught of world opinion. And they gave up in they gave up India. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. with his strategy of non-violence produced the same reaction. While supremacists finally became so extreme that they lost the support of the political system and most of the rest of the nation. Naming bad behavior without making yourself the issue is so powerful because it turns the other party's entire being against them. All the focus is on them. In the second debate of the 2008 U.S. President presidential election, Every time John McCain insulted Barack Obama, Obama was respectful. When McCain refused to shake Obama's hand after the debate, Obama was gracious. All the negative focus was on McCain, as noted. McCain probably lost the election then and then. In corporate or relationship settings, you have to be careful about the way you name bad behavior. Tact is often required. One example is someone trying to take credit for your idea. You bring up a great idea in a meeting only to have someone paraphrase it as they own later in the meeting. This is a perfect occasion to name bad behavior without making yourself the issue. First, compliment them. That's excellent. You should say, without sarcasm, when I brought this idea up a few minutes ago, I was hoping someone else would endorse it. Glad to see we agree. Or if we want to be even tougher without making yourself the issue, you might say something like, Terrific. When I brought up the idea a few minutes ago, I didn't know anyone else was working on it. Then if you what your group has done with the idea and ask sweetly, so what have you all been doing with this idea? They may be offer their way out of it that time, but they'll never do it again. Clearly, practice makes all of this better. Practice framing questions in which standards are embedded. You'll get better and better at it. Ask, for example, watch fair here. How do we decide? Should I pay for your mistakes? Is your company's goal to make customers happy? <sighs> Not getting upset when the other person violates their own standards is a key. It takes a change in attitude to get it right. For example, every time someone tries to cheat me, he tell my team not to get upset. Look at it this way, I say. We just made money. We named the bad behavior and get a cheat. I'm happy when others try to cheat. Now I have them pay as cheaters. And I can use it forever. When people don't return phone call or emails, try not to get upset. Just keep a list of the dates and times of your call. When you get enough of a record, email them and say, Guy, we called you 14 times in the past two weeks. We were hoping to reach you. 
Is there something else we can do? Now, you got a record you can use with third parties, but you probably won't use it often. They almost always call back. Moira, Matt, Carla got to her beach house one rainy summer weekend only to find the landlord there with some of his friends. The landlord had assumed that he wouldn't be out for the weekend, she said. Many people would be angry at the landlord. This would have gotten her nowhere. The landlord would have become defensive and Moira would have had to shoot the landlord to enforce the lease. Instead, she was cruel as a cucumber. I asked him if we had paid for use of the house for the entire summer, seven days a week, for 16 weeks, she said. He admitted he had acted improperly. Still, matter of fact, Moira asked him for concession. She got two more weeks in September at no charge. People too often lose focus on their goals, said Moira. Later, a telecommunication manager in London and New York and now a stay-at-home mom for their for his kids aged 7, 10, and 11. Train yourself to do it. This, you get more this way. You meet your goals more often. Ben Young went to an electronics store in Manhattan to buy an extended life battery for his camcorder. Two hundred dollars. The sales man quoted him as a price. It was four times the normal price. Ben was ecstatic. So why is the price four times normal? Ben said sweetly, $100. The salesman said, Why did you just drop the price so much? Ben said, You must really be trying to gouge him. The price then went $8 to $60 and then to $55. The best price I can offer, the salesman said, at this point, Ben, now head of a real estate hedge fund, asked for the manager, is, he, is it your usual policy to quote four times the price of product to a customer? Ben said, <clears throat> the manager said, no, criticized the salesman, sold the product for $50 and threw in a free carrying case for many hassles. Water rush, hard bargains are fun. Kami Lim couldn't get repairs done in his apartment by the maintenance staff, but the staff did respond to angry complaints to the manager's office. So he said to the manager, Do you think it's a failure for a president who make the least noise to receive attention last? Kami, now director of a Singapore bank, essentially they bad behavior with good framing. The maintenance people showed up within four hours. When you do something wrong, do others try to exact too big a penalty from you? You can use your framing here to essentially they have behaved badly in overcharging you for your bad behavior. In such situations, you can ask, so how much do you want to hurt me for this? It gives people a sense of perspective. Terry Jones bought the wrong ticket for 
his New George transit commuter train. The ticket collector started to berate him and demanded that Terry buy an expensive one-way ticket to New York and pay a surcharge. So you want to give me the death penalty? Terry said, shocking. The conductor smiled and said he would come back. He never came back. James, Sierra fiance, received an un unqualified coupon from Cohen Optical for a new pair of glasses for $34. But the steward's sales clerk told her they were only for a limited number of cheap friends. Most people would just give up, not wanting to make a scene, but James decided he would calmly use standards and hold the store to each promise. James' fiance picked out a pair of French for $174.54. James introduced himself to the owner who confirmed it was a franchise and she had complete authority for items in the store. She also confirmed that customer satisfaction was very important at court, as is as say. I asked if it was Kohan's policy to honor each published coupon, James said. She said it was, that she declined to honor the coupon. James asked again if the Cohen stood behind each published advertise. She began blaming the advertising agency for making a mistake, James said. She started to get very heated about it. I kept my crew. I kept bringing her back to the same standard issues. Her authority, customer satisfaction, honoring each policy. I asked if money is more important than customer satisfaction and honoring each policy. Finally, she started screaming at James and his fiance. Okay, that's right. Make money is most important to me. James took a step back and waited. Suddenly, people in the crowded store stopped and looked at the owner. Surprised looks on their faces. A few seconds, seeming like an eternity, passed. James was already thinking about the letter he would write to corporate headquarters about this franchise. He knew, she knew that. I calmly started to restate her words to the rest of the now quiet store, James said. The owner stopped me, apologized, and said I was right. She said customers are in fact more important and the store would stand behind each advertise. He asked his fiance to give the owner the chosen frames and the coupon. They gave us the completed glasses in 30 minutes, he said. This goes farther than a lot of people would go to achieve fairness. James did report that he felt his lip quivering during this exchange, something I said would disappear with practice. But James stayed calm throughout. It was the owner who got upset. Would some people think those two shouldn't be penalized for the mistake of each ad agency, maybe. But I included this story to show you again how to go about doing this. Notice that James was incremental in his approach and never got rattled. We can apply it to things large and small in life. We all have to decide that.
that you will hold people to their promises. Now, let's look at some significant business negotiation and see how these tools apply. Some years ago, Hewlett Packard was involved in a major project to upgrade the computer facilities for telecom Egypt in Cairo. Another contractor was rude, sexist, and racist, and confrontational, according to HP. The American staffers there were up in arms. HP sent a couple of people to my office in Philadelphia for a few hours to talk with me about what to do using negotiation tools. For various business reasons, HP did not want to approach Telecom Egypt directly with anecdotal evidence they had. I asked the people from HP if there was any U.S. aid in the deal. There was a small amount of money from the U.S. Agency for International Development. A company is not allowed to participate in a project where U.S. laws are violated. The actions by the contractor clearly violate the U.S. laws and the most interested party in protecting U.S. laws would be the U.S. government, I suggested. So I advised the edge people to issue each of their employees notepads and pens. I suggested that for the next month, the edge employees should simply write down in their notebooks everything this guy said and did. Not to argue with him, protest, get angry, etc. At the end of the month, I said HP should collect the notebooks, put a rubber band around them. Alright, short summary, send them off to USAID in Washington and, and ask, what do you think? Within a short time, the contractor was gone. No moss, no fuss, no problem. This is a great example of using standards to deal with bad behavior. One of the most difficult, hard bargain situations I've been in occurred a few years ago during a major financing for a company in Ukraine. It was uh, $107, 107 $107.5 million euro bond issue for Ukraine's largest company, Eugenie Machines Building Plant. Ozmashi? Ozmash built most of the former Soviet Union's land-based intercontinental ballistic missiles for nuclear warheads. After the fall of the Soviet Union and Ukraine's independence, Uzmash sent its nuclear warhead to Moscow as part of this armament effort brokered by the Clinton administration to limit the number of countries with nuclear weapons. This goodwill by Ukraine got some Western business. One was the protect production of rockets by Yushmash for a commercial joint venture with Beck. Boeing to launch communications satellites. Uzmash needed working capital to build the rocket. The bond would be the largest foreign sourced commercial financing in the history of Ukraine. I was Uzmash's counsel 
charged with putting the deal together. Eventually, I persuaded JP Morgan in London to raise the money. The project began in 1998. When we received from the Ukraine Ministry of Finance an unconditional, irrevocable Ukraine government guarantee that I wrote for the $107.5 million <coughs> to be borrowed by Ujimashi. The guarantee was very tough. I thought financiers would need such a guarantee because Ujimashi had no history of Western borrowing and would be considered a big credit risk. In fact, the World Bank's European arm, the European Bank for its construction and development, turned down the loan twice as too risky. The Ukraine finance minister, however, was happy to provide the guarantee. It was an excellent political gesture. Since the immediate past president of Yuzhmashi was Leonid Kochman, then the president of Ukraine also it didn't cost the minister of finance anything. Since the guarantee wasn't worth the paper it was printed on, Ukraine had no investment grade international debt rating. I had won to this guarantee for five years until March 2003, when lo and behold, Ukraine got an international investment grade debt rating. <clears throat> we went back to the Ministry of Finance and said, essentially, hi. Here we are again, ready to deal, ready to do the deal. Both JP Morgan in London and each law firm, link letters, wanted the guarantee be endorsed because five years had passed. The Minister of Finance essentially told us to get lost. President Kochma was on his way out. The ministry was borrowing billions of billions of dollars from other governments, and the terms of our guarantee were to draconian. The minister was in the driver's seat, believing he had all the power. Since they were bringing in all this government money from abroad, they thought they had enough power to challenge President Kochma's wishes. Remember what I said earlier about the misuse of power. We tried being collaborative. This was great for Ukraine. We would establish a foreign sourced commercial lending market and open the way for all sorts of private economic growth in Ukraine to no avail. Finally, we had to use standards. The Yuzhmashi officials and I sat with the Minister of Finance and various deputy ministers. We made copies of the guarantee the minister had signed five years before. I asked the minister, does this guarantee say irrevocable? He did, of course. I then asked, what does irrevocable mean? That you can revoke it later when you feel like it. Clearly, that wasn't what irrevocable meant. Everyone got a bit uncomfortable. We are using their own standards against them. I then said, Does this guarantee say unconditional? Of course it did. What does unconditional mean? I asked. You can set 
condition later when you want. They grunted. Of course, it didn't mean that either. Then I turned to the last page of the guarantee and asked them to do so too. Is this your seal and signature of the Ministry of Finance of Ukraine on this irrevocable, unconditional government guarantee? I asked clearly it was. Finally, I said, so the standards that the Ukraine Ministry of Finance is setting for all those international lenders from who whom your government wants to borrow billions of dollars is that the Ukraine Ministry of Finance will break its commitment to foreign lenders when the ministry finds it convenient to do so. I suggested that this would not likely bring in many lenders. This was not a happy meeting. One deputy minister got so upset that he pointed out that we, Americans, were in the middle of Ukraine. I asked if he was physically threatening us. His extreme statement just undermined his credibility. The ministry we endorsed the guarantee and we did the I didn't just want to leave the relationship with the ministry in chambers, which is where it was at the end of the meeting. So afterwards, I talked to Yuzumashi, and we decided that the company would invite the minister to come on the roadshow with us. We were going at least to London, Vienna, and Frankfurt to meet her letters. Yuzmashi told the minister that he could meet new investors to whom he could pitch his own deals after he verified to them that he had been endorsed the Yuzmashi deal. This was clearly a benefit to him. So, the ministry sent another deputy minister to meet us. Finally, on the road, I had a couple of meals with the deputy, not alone, but with others. By the end of the week, he said hello to me when he passed me in the hallway. It had been very much a hard bargaining situation, but we met our goals, and in the end, I did, did what was best for all parties. Of course, it is very important in all of this to make sure the other party is actually behaving better. <clears throat> that means you still first have to go through the process of collecting information. You have to find out what's really going, to, going on. Brian Holmes was the brand manager for a major non-prescription medicine. He got a call from his factory manager saying that the quality control people had rejected another batch from Ferrer to Rico. Brian said he wanted to see all the facts before making a decision. What are the rejection standards? Brian found out that the standard rejection rate for non prescription drugs was 3%, but the Puerto Rico factory was being held to much strictly. 1% ejection rate used for prescription medicines. This was a mistake, Brian said. 1% is almost impossible to meet for a non-prescription drug when the 3% ejection rate was restored. The factory did just fine. The wrong standards had been used. It seems obvious when broken down into each element. But how many people do this? Sean Rodriguez was told that federal regulation required 
his lower interest loans to be paid off first. This turned out to be incorrect. But Sean's conversation with the loan rep did not have to be hostile. All Sean needed to do was to get her name and ask for whatever backup she had. Once he checked it out and found out the plan wasn't true, he was able to get something for it. I didn't assume a word, said Sean, now an associate in the law firm of Gibson, Dunn and Crutcher. To be contentious would have been counterproductive. I just fixed the problem, got the credit, and met my goals. Rebel, your competitive attitude. Think about when you played competitive sports, baseball, football, hockey, swimming, etc. When you were in the thick of competition, what were you thinking about? By far the number one answer in my course is winning. At least 95% of the answers, but it's the wrong answer. If you think of winning, you will lose. Here is a better question. What were you focused on? The answer should be the goal, the puck, your stroke, your breathing. The mutest details of your craft. If you are gymnast and don't do that, you will break your arm on the parallel bar. Competitive negotiation is exactly the same. Don't get distracted by where distraction, winning, losing, what happened yesterday, unfair play, a referee's call, what might happen tomorrow, the next period of penalty, the emotion of the moment. Instead, execute and focus what are my goals? What standards should I use? What are their needs? Can I book my common enemies? Can I form a vision of a relationship? Who is their decision maker, etc. Before you negotiate, to be sure, you will strategize and prepare then you will focus and execute your strategy dispassionately. If you see a problem, you take a break. You examine your strategy. Make any needed changes. Then you will go back into the negotiation and execute again. This is a powerful process. It works for the best sports teams and the best negotiators. It's also important to consider this method with hard bargains. Because the world is a place where many people cheat. People who cheat are hard bargainers. They make it hard to get fair process and results. So your attitude in approaching hard bargainers is important. Don't let them get to you so you become emotional and make a mistake. Focus on your goals by going through the passionate process just described. You are much better able to deal with hard bargains. In competitive life, there are two kinds of people, those who are qualified, and those who try to steal from those who are qualified. What this really means is that many, if not most, hard bargainers act the way they do because they lack the skill to meet their goals fair and square. So they have to lie, cheat, and steal. The key is to not get upset and or take it personally. We skilled people have to eat too. Indeed, in top economic times, studies show 
the number of people who cheat Bojo. So just figure out your goals, use your negotiation tools, meet your goals, and move on. They are who they are. Lower your expectation of others' partnership trustworthiness. That way, you'll never be disappointed and you'll often be pleasantly surprised. Again, these tools don't work all the time with all people. John Layton asked a manager at Neiman Marcus some years ago for a discount on a damaged humidor. The manager said, no, is it the position of Neiman Marcus to offer damaged merchandise at the same price as undam undamaged merchandise? Asked John, managing director of an asset management fund. The manager refused to lower the price and walked away. This happens sometimes. The world has all sorts of people, though it's unlikely this would happen in today's economic climate. John could have reported her to Neymar Marcus executives. Others did and got all kinds of goodies, or he could have posted this on a blue. Your ability to use standards is often limited only by your creativity, talent, a large ledge. Now an innovative director at Lexor Smith Klein shared the course notes with her husband John. She rightly figured that if two people understand these tools, the way they negotiate with each other will be even better. One day, he said to her, you don't love me. Hal was started. She wanted to know why he thought that. <clears throat> he told her that she had a really bad cough and refused to go to the doctor. He told me that since I'm not taking care of myself, I'm not living up to that, up to the bargain of a long and happy life together, he said. If you die early, you will leave me alone, thus you don't love me. Over dramatic, perhaps. But a lovely way to make a point as an alternative to Megan. Helen went to the doctor. <clears throat> 